many, many ways our speakers don't need introduction, but in case there is a need, um, here, here goes. Um, I've been given this case, so I didn't take notice of this for what comes out here, and I've even edited it. Right. Um, Ken Livingston was a member of Greater London Council from 76, I even remember those days, and its leader from 1981 until the council was abolished in 1986. He became the first elected mayor of London from the creation of the offices in 2000 until 2008. And he also served as the member of parliament for Brent East from 1987 to 2001. He was largely responsible for the GLC's popular affairs fair policy, uh, which significantly cut the price of travel, and I'd like to see that again, again back, uh, in, in London Transport. Uh, Ken Evanston was also instrumental, as you all know, in introducing the London congestion charge in an attempt to reduce traffic congestion in the city. Now, there's a section here um, about his relationship with the Labour Party, which I'll skip. Um, <laughs> and then it goes on and says, um, however, one of the key points, and here um, we have my total support, one of the key points of conflict between the Labour Party and, and Mr. Livingston has been the proposed partial privatization of the London Underground. Well, we did tell them, didn't we? Mm. Um, Livingston has proposed that funds should be raised in, to improve the tube infrastructure by public bonds issue, uh, as had been done in the case of the New York City subway, but Labour kept pushing their, and now the coalition, their public-private partnership schemes to which Livingston, and forgive me for not putting Mr. Livingston on hand here, was forced to concede um, after he lost a legal challenge in July 2002. And, and um, I, I would encourage us to very much look at the experience of PPPs because there seems to be not sufficient uh, uh, learning uh, from these experiences. They seem to be rolled out globally. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Ken, over to you. Well, thanks very much. Sorry I missed the start of the Peter's thing, but uh, there was delays on the Jubilee line again, which I, I, I no longer responsible for. Let me start by saying where I'm coming from. I'm, I was born in 1945, so I grew up in a Britain where my parents' generation were <coughs> our future. I, the papers were always filled with proposals for you know, the transformation of our cities, a broad assumption that one day everyone would own a car and, and public transport would die out. By the time I got involved in politics, we were caught having this massive row in London because both Labour and Tory governments and <coughs> Labour and Tory administrations of uh, county hall were committed to building three great ringways in London. Um, all within the area, uh, now surrounded by the M25. And the most controversial of these was uh, the inner one that ran through Brixton and Hampstead, much of it elevated and involving the demolition of thousands of homes. And as it ran through um, the constituency and where I was standing in 1973, and the massive, the greatest concentration of um, demolished homes was going to be in the safest Tory wards. I made it the central part of my campaign <laughs> and had a very good result. Um, and I think the thinking of, of all of that really, I mean, is bizarre because if you go back 30 years previously to the 1930s in New York, when LaGuardia was mayor and Robert Moses was the great big infrastructure builder, there was a series of and new, you know, motorways open. Um, each of them planned uh, to cope with the increase in car usage. And I think there were three, i.e. from about 34 to, to the start of the Second World War. And the planners would all say, once this is built, it will absorb all the extra car capacity for the next 10 years. And as each of them opened, they were chock a block and grid off within about three or four months. And it just seemed to me that I mean, whatever road capacity you build, it will be filled up with cars. When you look at, I mean, back in the 70s, the big earthquake in San Francisco, where two of the, the flyovers coming into San Francisco were demolished, it was chaos for about three months, and then car usage coming into the city declined to uh, the, the existing reduced capacity. And I do think 
This is what underlies so much of transport planning. I mean, if you build it, they will come. I, and, you know, there's just no end to this. And therefore, I, uh, I mean, my sort of political educational is about improving the public transport system and providing an alternative to our users. And I think what applies to London and New York may not apply to much else. Two great world cities, a very dense, a not built for the car in any sense. And I think the only two cities I'm aware of where a car usage is declining without government strategy and intervention to actually force that. People are making much more rational choices. I, mean, I, I, I started driving lessons in the mid-1960s, but not because it would be easier to get to work. I just thought I'd have more success with girls if I had a car. <laughs> and, and it's the simple, blunt reality of it um, for a lot of young men, of course. And it occurred to me, I mean, if somebody, my first morning as mayor, there'd be no car service for the members down at City Hall, that I would spend perhaps 40, 45 minutes getting into work on, on the underground. Or I could have spent perhaps 30 minutes on a good day in the car. But that, that you know, that slot each day was time to read. It's four working weeks a year. In a working lifetime, it's four years. You can read the paper, or you can read the work. And if we get people to think objectively about this, a really good public transport service, as well as all the environmental benefits, just makes a lot of sense. So my entire political career has been geared around sort of being broadly anti-road and broadly pro-public transport. I did, when I became the leader of the GLC in 1981, there were a huge array of old uh, road schemes been kicking around for years. And we did a, and Mrs. Thatcher's government, which had taken power two years earlier, was completely hostile to public transport. There was nothing coming for that. But they were prepared to fund um, road building. And there were three roads in London which seemed to us, I mean, just about justifiable. One, the Hayes Bypass, which got traffic down to Heathrow Airport. This was the most question because it did generate extra traffic. But the whole of the air around there since the 1932 planned on the assumption that it would be built. Um, and there was a, you know, a real problem of actually not completing what was uh, almost a, a 40 year planning strategy. But then another road running up to the, the north of London to Enfield um, to serve what was still a very um, uh, large uh, manufacturing base and get traffic in out there. And then a thing called the, the Rochester Way Relief Road. Uh, which was to help take some of the huge pressure off the A2 coming into South East London, and that if you go down and see today is still relatively empty, I have to say. So we did build those three roads. We ruled out all the others because on, on balance, I mean, that you couldn't make a justification. And when the GLC was abolished, the first thing that the Thatcher government did was revive all the schemes we said we wouldn't proceed with and start to work them up again. They had to work them up because we shredded all the plans, but we thought they might do that. They, but by the time uh, they'd actually spent three or four years working on this, I can't remember if that's another economic crisis that came on, they, they decided not to proceed with any of them. And this is one of our problems, they, which is quite unique to Britain. They, in all that period after the Second World War, we had what was then called stop go. Every time the economy started to grow, you know, over 3% a year, there'd be a balance of payments crisis, the government would then make substantial cuts and tax increases and we'd go back um, to, to a much lower level of growth. And the quite interesting thing in all this was, I mean, we had a balance of payments crisis, I mean, again and again, right through that period, right up until the mid-1970s. And it was largely because the scale of our military spending overseas I mean, was out of all relation to any other European power. If we hadn't been, you know, running a, a big military operation in the Middle East and Far East, we'd only have had a balance of payments deficit in three years in the 30 after the war. But that obsession of politicians to play on the global stage, even if you're a country that's only got that 1% of the world's population, meant an awful lot of the projects that would have happened, that were being worked on, but cut when the next downturn in public spending. <coughs> and so it was really messy. There was no great, an awful lot of plans were done, 
There's you know, the Abercrombie plan and the Great London Development Plan, and then I, I produced a, a plan which broadly my success was largely carried on with a couple of minor amendments. There are lots of plans, but I mean, always an economic crisis leading to a project being cut or delayed. And the, the bizarre thing in all of this is when you come to uh, look at uh, the, 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 the problems with all this. I, the Victoria Line, which opened in 1969 and then the Britain Extension in 71, was first proposed, I think, in 1938. A, a fleet line, often now called the Jubilee Line, which eventually uh, opened in 1979, the extension, um, down to, to Charing Cross, which is no longer used. Uh, that was first proposed, I think, in 1947-48. Crossrail, which would eventually open in 2018, um, the earliest proposed line, actually physically found, was 1969, when it was costed at £300 million rather than the, uh, the, the £15 billion it's costing now. And this just seems to be a classic pattern with what's wrong with planning and strategic thinking in Britain. That it takes, you know, 30 to 40 years to get permission and build um, a, a, a railway. Um, and this is, that is also, compared with, say, Shanghai, who took a decision in the run-up to the World Expo to create an underground system the size of London and did it, I think, in 15 years. Mind you, they didn't have all the, the problems of planning and quarries that the when someone took a decision, it actually happened. And so, I, by the time I became mayor, in a position where you know, still a lot of schemes kicking around the but the Chelsea Hackney line is still being talked about today, a DLR, often like rail extensions and so on, a extension to the Jubilee Line just by me at the um, just literally um, before the mayor election, another extension that took out. So I became mayor with a huge list of potential projects for London, not just in transport, but in uh, modernising our, our sewage system, our water, and all of that. But broadly, our infrastructure was built by the Victorians and is, you know, should have had a real a programme of uh, modernisation and upgrading decades ago, as they always put off every time there's an economic crisis. So I started lobbying <coughs> for this. And here's just a particularly bizarre problem in British politics. Uh, the Secretary of State for Transport is always considered at the fringe of the cabinet. Uh, it's, the, it's the first job you get when you are appointed into the cabinet, and then you move on to something much more interesting and important, like you know, warfare or education or, or whatever. And by the time I became the Mayor of London, I think we had 20 sectors of state of transport in the preceding 23 years. And broadly, we've carried on with that ever since. I think it's government tax or whatever. Um, but that, for me, was a real problem. Because within the department, the permanent officials were totally hostile to any transport project whatsoever. Largely, I suspect, because almost every project they'd ever been involved in has had huge delays, huge cost overruns, endless public criticism, parliamentary inquiries, and therefore, it was safer just to sit there until you retired rather than ever doing anything. Okay? And I went through this ridiculous, the eight years that I was mayor, I spent you know, endless with more meetings with the, the, the transport ministers and the schools and the others put together. I've been there lobbying for this or that scheme. And you get them to a point where they're just about to agree it, and the bloody prime minister would move them. And you start all over again with the same officials sitting there telling the minister why it shouldn't be done. <laughs> and so that's a particular day. I expect many other countries don't have such a rapid turnover of transport ministers. And therefore, almost everything I got done was by you know, scheming and dissembling and the use of the Olympics. I, if I think back to the extension of the Docklands Light Rail to City Airport. <clears throat> Absolute nonsense to build an airport without a public transport connection. Um, but that had happened. But there was a DLR just a, a few miles away, and you could link it up. It had been talked about, talked about, talked about. Hey, there had been a public inquiry, and the public inquiry had given the go ahead. All that was required was for the Department of Transport to agree that the mayor could raise the funds, or they would raise the funds, to actually build it. And we went out, 
we got tenders, the tenders came in, it was a clear, obvious, funny contractor, the best place to deliver it. And month after month went by, the Department of Transport would not give permission for the sign from that. And then, you know, blessedly, along came the Olympics. We decided, I, I mean, I had no interest in sport whatsoever, I said, to me, you must have been terribly sad to see Boris at the Olympics. And I was quite happy, I was bored out myself, endlessly sitting through sporting events. But I went to a sporting event once in 1972 and never sleep at a cricket match at all. I simply saw this very, very long shot, because at the time we decided to bid, we, we actually just had to ask the International Athletics Association to take back the, the um, event, yeah, uh, their, their event which was supposed to be a piggy slot because the incoming Labour government had got to build the stadium. Wembley was an absolute <coughs> international uh, disaster area where basically the private sector doing it but screwing it up just as badly as the public sector did. And there was a broad presumption that they were just hopeless at delivering infrastructure projects on time. So nobody <coughs> seriously thought they had a chance to win the Olympics. I didn't really, but I thought to make a credible bid the government will have to invest in public transport. You know, because the only way to have an Olympics working in these centre London is a big upgrade of public transport capacity in the minute. How <coughs> cynical is that? And of course, uh, the DLR extension to City Airport was part of that, another DLR extension up to Stratford. So, I, and also, we wanted to take over just about our most neglected and badly run private rail line, what used to be called the North London Line, now to the London Overground. All relatively minor projects, but making a big impact to London. And I was absolutely overjoyed because the initial assessment of the International Olympic Committee, which they do about 18 months before they make a decision, um, which is sort of guidance to cities about what they need to do, very, very, you know, it supported the idea that you could have a good business in London. But the real focus, the real focus on the, the lack of the public transport capacity. So I said the wages is around in front of um, Gordon Brown's officials and so the bid won't be credible uh, unless a, we actually get a, a real increase in investment in public transport in the area. Now, most of the, I, mean, I think the civil service just assumed this was only there and can live in and have some fantasy about it in its coming. But nobody wanted to be seen to sabotage it. Initially, I, the Treasury under Gordon Brown has announced you can only have the Olympics in London pay its full bit. Well, he's been in town with a bit of a burden on eight million people. Um, but we managed to do a deal and, and the government picked up 90% of it. But nobody actually wanted the finger of blame saying you stop us getting the Olympics. And so I, I was delighted that Gordon Brown's Treasury eventually said the Mayor of London will be given the power to borrow £2.9 billion on bond markets to fund these transport improvements. Now, actually, I almost fell over when I heard this, but I can't, I, Peter might remember, I can't remember the last time any part of local government in Britain was given freedom to go to the bond markets to, to raise money. Um, but we did, and all those projects happened, and it has absolutely transformed I, that area uh, around the east end of London, and of course was a key factor in making the Olympics work. Then the problem, having got the money, was to make sure we had people who could deliver it constantly. The problem, I mean, it's quite interesting, I'm sure there are problems in the delivery of the transport infrastructure projects happening in China, but because there's project after project after project, people who make a mistake on one learn from that, and the other projects they go on to deliver, they're unlikely to repeat it. Our problem is that, you know, for about the last 35 years, we really uh, have woefully underinvested in infrastructure. We lost the, the, the skills that would be there because, you know, it, it was so infrequent. We didn't have the people who had a track record for delivering infrastructure projects, which is why when I became, I became mayor, a, the entire team we brought in to run our public transport system came from the United States of America. We went to Bob Kiley, who'd actually overseen the modernization of the New York Underground, before that the Boston Underground. And we, we didn't exclude all grit, Peter Henry, I mean, he's very good at transforming the bus for this, but I mean, broadly we had to bring in people from outside with a record of having to do infrastructure projects, because there really was nobody. I mean, with those skills here. You've got to have a constant, fairly level um, 
of people stuck in investment to develop those skills for messaging. So all these Americans came in. And I have to say, watching them work in comparison with our traditional civil servants was breathtaking. Here were people with sort of confidence, wanting to do things, rather than all those Department of Treasury officials desperately trying to avoid doing anything um, in case it all went wrong. Um, probably, I, I think there's only one infrastructure project in the eight years that I was mayor that was I, delayed I, seriously, and that was the calls to my class where in the midst of digging, <coughs> so we discovered a vast gas main under the, 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 the road. <coughs> that, wasn't supposed to be, that, that was a minor problem. Um, how on earth, I mean, the gas pool, I don't know what the gas pool, but uh, the, the, or was the gas pool, could lose these details about where their bloody pipes are. It's quite beyond me. And uh, they got ahead and they delivered. And I, although I say, you know, you need that permanent power project to develop the skill. Something that undermines that is the one bit of Britain where we have been paying our infrastructure spending, which is on military um, equipment. They, 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 our prime ministers all about running around the world <coughs> draft with the military and so on. Um, and so the, the whole vast array of projects, and they are all breathtakingly late and massively expensive. So there in the Department of Transport, you've got the only part of British government where there's been a constant flow of major projects and its record of delivery has been disastrous. Don't ask me to explain why that should be. I mean, no, nobody in the late party ever allowed me anywhere near anything to do with our military. Um, so part, how did we get into this mess? If you actually look, it's quite interesting because Britain and America parallel each other in so much of I mean, it's a post-war period. Reagan and Thatcher coming into power at probably the same time and transforming the old Keynesian consensus into a Friedmanite one. And Friedman was pretty disappointed in both of them by the end. Um, but if you look back, in that 30 years after the Second World War, Britain and America consistently invested about 5.5% of GDP in public infrastructure. And therefore, there were a whole series of things going on, and not as much as we should have done, but constantly uh, 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 layers of young men, <coughs> and women, various, coming up delivering these projects. And then, when Mrs. Thatcher became Prime Minister, that was cut 1% of GDP. When Reagan got in, it was cut 3%. Under Tony Blair, it was cut 1.5%. And for me, I think that. The biggest single factor in economic success is investment, both public and private. Hey, so Peter touched on this issue of you know, how we get these projects funded and whether the <coughs> private sector will build roads. My, my broad suspicion is they won't. Hey, hey, it seems to me, if you actually look at American governors and mayors and governments, that's the hey, Eisenhower's huge interstate uh, program. Hey, the way this works is the state puts in the infrastructure, whether it's road or rail, and the power, and the sewer, and all that. And then the private sector comes and builds around it. And that was eventually the argument, the final argument, that managed to persuade a Gordon Brown, who was then on the verge of becoming Prime Minister, to authorise five billion of funding from the government for Crossrail. <coughs> and Crossrail is on a scale unlike anything we've seen. It's the Crossrail, the trains are twice the length of the tube train, I mean, if you just go past any of the sites where the stations are being built, there's been chaos rates, as you'd expect. This is a vast infrastructure project. And we were able to demonstrate, finally, a overcoming Treasury Department of Transport dishonest statistics. But broadly, the rate of return the government would get is increased tax revenue from the private sector development would follow this huge and um, e-rail project was at, at least two to one and possibly as high as three to one. And therefore, I, we, we actually got that project off the ground. And as I say, it will open in 2017. But people have been making the case for that since 1969. Now, I can understand how at a time when London's population was going down, which it did right away into the 1980s, and it wasn't unplanned. The Abercrombie plan in 1943, 44, set a target of reducing London's population, which was then 8.3 million, to 5 to 5.5 million by 1990. When you get on Victoria Line, I think 
what idiot would build such small platforms and so few escalators <laughs> in a city like this? That was designed on the assumption by now there'd be five million Londoners. Of course, as we said, we're back up to 8.3. We're on our way to 9 million. And so Crossrail 2 and Crossrail 3 aren't just that way. They're going to be essential. Uh, public transport system is absolutely at any capacity at the moment. And we're the best part of another three quarters of a million people coming. We've actually got to continue to expand our infrastructure as dramatically as we can. So I think investment is the key. Let the state put in that infrastructure, the private sector will then come um, and, and build around what's been put in. And I think that's the way it works. We tried desperately <coughs> in this country, both Labour and Tory governments, to get the private sector involved in public infrastructure. When we drew up the plan for the Olympics, and it very rough, I estimate, but we didn't think we were going to win. We couldn't do the detailed, massive examination of the site and cost it. It cost about £200 million, but we prepared a really detailed plan. The initial idea was it cost about £4.2 billion. I, but we said the public will only need to pay £2.9 billion because the private <coughs> didn't want to get involved. There wasn't a single firm in Britain wish to be involved in delivering a single part of that um, Olympics uh, as a, 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 a something that they were quite happy to be paid to build it, but not to be a part of it. Um, if I look at the torturous um, PPP on the underground, the incoming Labour government recognising that you know, the tube was at a point of falling apart, you really needed a massive um, investment to renew the rail, the city, everything. Um, and this, you know, we started out being talked about I think five billion, it went up to eight, then it went up to about fifteen billion over a thirty year period. And they devised uh, they called it public private partnership, which you know, seemed a bit nicer than PFI. Uh, and they tried to devise a thirty year contract to replace with everything. At the end of the day the contracts were two million words long. It's the equivalent of two Ford or Farming cabinets. Drafted by officials of the Department of Transport, we were really taken to the feelings. Because what I noticed about bringing Bob Kine into Central America, they were every bit as ruthless and brutal as the private sector people they were dealing with and managed to blow mm -hmm. them into the ground. Our civil servants seem to just say, well, what do you need? You know, and you let us know what it will cost. And it never seems to be the real ruthless aggression that we're dealing with on the other side of this negotiation. And of course, it was disastrous. A primary, I mean, do, there were two contracts. One led by Bechtel, who have a whole history of delivering major infrastructure projects, usually on time, on budget, except of course the, the, the Boston um, Ring Road that was built underground, which was probably just you know, horrendously complicated. They, it didn't work out terribly well, but it, they broadly managed to do their balance. It wasn't as profitable as they wanted, and we were quite tough on them. The other, which was led by Balfour, would be much more traditional, less imaginative um, British construction firm, put together a coalition, uh, including Thames Water, um, uh, and EDF Energy, and uh, Bombardier, and so on. So five firms. Having won two thirds of this £30 billion contract, they then decided to all, all the work themselves without completely. And they just didn't. I mean, when you think, we calculated these contracts were about 20% over what they should have been. But in just three years, that Balfour BT led consortium had run up a deficit of 1.8 billion. And they came to me and said, Will you be a guarantor for this, I, to cover this deficit? And I said, Pat Ross, they brought the liquidation, we bought them for a pound, and now it's called to be sorted out. So this idea that somehow the state can devise an incredibly complicated system that will bring in the private sector to do work that primarily should be done by the public sector, I, I think uh, if anyone comes up with one of those, I'll be interested to see it. And finally, I just had to <coughs> touch to, to what we said towards the end about the West being in decline. I, I, my view, I mean, it's also now the economic consensus. 50% at least 
of what makes a successful economy is the level of investment. It equals every other factor put together. And if you look, Britain when Britain had 2% of the world's population at the start of our glorious empire. But we were the first country in the world to invest 7% of GDP. It gave us a century of global dominance. America, after its civil war, invested 19%. It gave them the domination of the 20th century. West Germany led the rest of Western Europe out of the cash of the Second World War, and in its peak year, 1973, invested 25% of GDP. Britain had lived up 20% that year. Japan leapfrogged into second place as a world economy, its peak year, 38%. Today, well, the year of the banking crisis, China was investing its response to banking crisis was to increase that to 26. Here in Britain, we're down to 14 percent. And increasingly, in a, in a world where high-tech, a well-educated workforce, <coughs> these are the keys to success. A, a level of investment is absolutely crucial. And whether the West is in some long-term decline, and that's inevitable, whether it's because we're just not investing enough, I, we will never expect now before we will both be dead and gone. Whatever this issue is resolved. But I think <coughs> the government needs to think 25 years ahead and have a strategy that delivers long term infrastructure projects to build a guarantee for the success of a nation um, or a city. Or it might just be that we won't. And if you recall one of Marx's, well, that's not what I recall Marx's writings, but Marx, one of Marx's most controversial um, theories was about a declining rate of profit. That once you had a mature capitalist society, you got a declining rate of profit. That is perhaps another answer. It was the thing most economists rejected right the way through. That could be another answer to the mess we're in. I hope that isn't the case, because I still hope we can elect politicians <coughs> to prepare.